Hi, Siobhan. Thank you so much for, well, first of all, for inviting me. You're actually uh, the reason I came. Don, Don Warren, you're very famous and esteemed, but Siobhan worked her charm over the phone and said, you have to come. Maybe under your direction, I'm not sure. So my name is Tlesla Evan Adams <clears throat> from Tla'ama Nation, which is uh, very close to um, the city of Vancouver in Canada, only about 100 miles, but pretty isolated. And I grew up on this really small uh, reservation. And I was really happy, uh, really, well, pr I was pretty happy there. And I wanted to share with you some of those, um, some of that journey, just because I, not because I want to talk about myself, though that's kind of a fun indulgence, but because I want you to see yourselves um, in my story, in, in, in our story. So many of you, so many of us, have come from a very different place than we're um, driving towards or that we've, been, that we've um, arrived at. And it's, um, it's quite interesting and fun. So I, I played Thomas, but I'm a doctor now. And I want to tell you a bit about that to encourage you, because so many of, of us, and I'm speaking to the students here, and I hope you know and feel this, so many of us are cheering you on and want you to do well. And I know it's crazy, because when I was your age, and like uh, some of the old ladies, they would say things like, it just makes us happy to see you. And I thought, that's so ridiculous. <laughs> but now that I'm older, uh, it's really true. We're so happy to see you, and so happy to see you here working so hard um, towards your futures. And we're cheering you on. I just wanted to say, because people like to hear about smoke signals, and I, I really, I can't believe 22 years after I made smoke signals, people say to me, hey, Victor, every single day. <laughs> uh, and and uh, th the other day, one of our grand chiefs introduced me as Old Thomas. Not as Thomas, but as old Thomas. Uh, and, I, and I had a young woman, like a young university student, come up to me and she said, I hear you're Thomas. And I said, yeah, yeah that's me. And she said, you're so old. <laughs> and I said, yeah, that was a long time ago. That was really a long, 22 years ago. And I, when Smoke Signals came out the same weekend, the same weekend Smoke Signals came out in Calgary, I started medical school. And I had made a decision that no matter what happened with smoke signals, because we were getting some early reports that the test audiences loved the, the movie and that it was um, uh, bracing to be seen in lots of different places, I was still committed to um, helping the people. I'd been a professional actor for a long time, and I really wanted to uh, stay on that track. So I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so uh, again, uh, thank you, Dr. Westcott. And uh, I, I can't believe in what esteemed company I am. I'm so pleased to see so um, many of you uh, here. Uh, any of you who could be delivering a much stronger message than me, but you've invited me, so I, I'm very flattered. And I, I want to say um, hooray to all of you who finished your uh, Indians into Medicine Summer Institute. I hear it was quite rigorous. Quite a, quite a few of the students came up to me and said, that was a living hell, I'm so glad it's over. <laughs> I really want to sleep in. No, you didn't really say that, I'm, I'm being dramatic. And I do want to say welcome to the circle of care. Caring for each other, caring for the people, caring for our families is actually holy work. It's incredibly hard. I finally understand when my dad says, it's easy to be bad, it's hard to be good. It's hard to look after each other. It's really easy just to be mean and ugly to others. So thank you for um, thinking about um, helping us, helping others in the helping professions. I do have a bit of a, um, I do have a bit of a message though that I think is really important. When I was your age, I really didn't understand many of the wisdoms that I was hearing from my elders. I, I just would hear them, and I would try and remember them. I'd try and figure out what they meant. But it, sometimes it takes a while. But my dad always said, when I was your age as students, don't be afraid of being good at what you do. Don't worry if someone bugs you for being smart in school. We're Indians. We're resourceful. 
so he always encouraged me. He said, don't let anyone make fun of you because uh, you're a bit of a nerd. And I took him at his word. I took him at his word and I said, yeah, I'm not going to be ashamed about being good at school. I was good at school, but it was like being short. It just kind of happened. <laughs> I didn't do anything to be able to read a book and remember it. I didn't do anything to be this short. It just happened. But my father said, we are adaptable. And this concept of two-eyed seeing is important to me. And, and I really wanted to um, share it with you because I hope that um, it will um, help you uh, be inside your skin and help you accept um, this incredible journey that uh, you're upon. So this concept of two-eyed seeing, for those of you, I, I'm not sure if you studied the neural system or senses or human anatomy uh, this, uh, this past summer, but basically we have um, two eyes, two different points of view, but it unites into a single vision. If you cross your eyes, you can see double. Uh, we have something called conjugate gaze. When our eyes look in the same direction, more or less they see, they, you, those, those, our brain can put those pictures together into a single vision. Uh, but still, two points of view, two eyes, a single vision, it gives us better depth perception. It gives, gives us a wider field of vision. It allows us to be able to discern distance better, which helps us hunt and fish. It helps us do art. It helps us see each other to notice clues much, much better than if we had only one eye. And of course, having two eyes is always better in case you lose one eye. And in Canada, we have a, a wonderful um, elder um, who has talked to us, his name was Albert Marshall, about two-eyed seeing, about not being apologetic, about seeing things from two different points of view, that from our worldview, having two worldviews or maybe even many worldviews at once is completely normal. And for some of us, this is um, natural and easy, but for some of us, uh, it's not. And so when we think about two-eyed seeing, it means that um, we can do things like um, look back uh, at our great-grandmother, who was a midwife and who helped uh, with uh, bodies when people had passed away, I can say, I, I understand that. I am at peace with that. That is a good thing. That is a, a beautiful thing. But also still be a Western-trained uh, physician and say, I have a place in that. That's OK. And two-eyed seeing allows us to not just look outward, and definitely as students, you're asked to look at things, to read things, to notice things, to remember things, to externalize, or to look at the external world. But as Indians, we're asked to look inwards as well. I certainly was. My father would say, you have to learn to hear your own voice. You have to hear your own song. You have to find your own strength. You don't want to be that person who's always crying about everything. Oh, I'm hungry. I'm tired. This is hard. Let's go home. I just want to watch TV. I don't want to listen to grandma. You don't want to be that person. You want to be strong, be able to sit in place and to tolerate even things like um, hunger or pain or sadness. Because uh, he would say, uh, none of us get out of this life without having our heart broken at least once. And that, that, is, that is life. And of course, uh, we're Indians. We look back. We look back at our glorious past. We, we look back uh, at the timeless knowledge and culture and language that we've been given. We look at the territories around us, the very same territories that a thousand generations of our ancestors have looked at. We're in the same place. Yes, it's a different time, and maybe we are different from them. But uh, we can reconcile that. We can be at peace with our past at the same time as moving towards our future. And that's why I'm so excited. So there is, it is actually incredibly wonderful where all of you um, are going. And of course, holding two points of view at once means that we can laugh. So this, this um, cartoon says, uh, the radio's talking, it says, non-white babies now outnumber white babies in America for the first time. And the elder says, second. <laughs> and we can laugh at that and say, well, actually, we're not trying to be political. That's just true. And we can laugh. 
Um, I have a family. I, I like to talk about them because m my culture and probably yours demands that we be authentic and that we be honest and we tell the truth, even if it's um, difficult or it's painful. And I think sometimes people would uh, think that I came from privilege. Uh, and uh, I just want to remind uh, uh, all of you who've um, come from difficult places uh, that some of us have come from difficult places. Um, those of you who've um, suffered tremendous setbacks and been heartbroken, uh, some of us have come from that as well. When I was a little boy, uh, my sister was um, injured in an accident and it really um, made me fearful. It made me think that there was danger around us in the everyday all the time. Uh, and I remember when we were waiting for an ambulance, we, we had heard of ambulances. Actually, if you can imagine, I'm so old that there were hardly any ambulances. I think the ambulance had just been invented when I was a little boy. But my sister got hurt and we were waiting for an ambulance and we were like, an ambulance is gonna come, we think, we hear, there are these things. And uh, when I got older, it doesn't, it doesn't surprise me that now uh, my work is to help communities be prepared for medical emergencies. That is exactly what I do. I want to help communities have the things they need um, to help the people because people getting hurt and having setbacks, like a kid falling in the playground, is actually kind of predictable. That's why we have emergency rooms. We're ready if someone falls down and breaks their arm, come and see us. We know just what to do. And uh, my parents went to residential school. Uh, my mother went uh, to an Indian hospital. Uh, she went to a TB sanatorium. She's part of a court case now around that. She was taken when she was three. Her father had tuberculosis, but they took my mother and they didn't take my grandfather. I don't know what that was about. She went from the Indian hospital to the residential school and she stayed there until she finished her grade 12. Uh, but when she was 12, um, this boy came, he was a wild boy. He was 15 before they caught him. He had been living in the bush. It was my dad. His, uh, <laughs> his um, grandmother who raised him. Um, and, and my father said, my, sorry, my grandmother was a strong and honest woman. So when she said she felt that she would die without me when he was a baby, uh, I believed her. I believed her, her story. Uh, so that was what he was told. And so she kept him. Um, and they were on the run. And uh, they were caught when he was 15. But uh, in his mind, he was a man. And he went to residential school and he called it very simply a prison for children. Uh, and they, uh, my parents fell in love. They were... Uh, 12 and 15, 12 and 15. Yeah, everyone always laughs, they're like, 12? My dad goes, yeah, but she was big, like, like she was, it was like she was 15 and I was 12. <laughs> and they've been together for 66 years. They're still alive, I'm so lucky to have them. But when they, um, when my mother finally graduated from school and they married and they went to live in my father's grandmother's house, and my father's grandmother didn't speak English. My mother didn't speak our language. My father asked my mother to cook him fish head soup, which looks just like this. It's a fish head with some stuff thrown in, boiling water. But my mother didn't know to take the gills out. And my great-grandmother said, where did you find this woman? She's so dumb. My mother still doesn't laugh at this story. She's still mad at my, my great-grandmother. And I think, in fact, I know my, that's why my father insisted that I know our way. He didn't want me to be the first generation of Indian who didn't know what to do with a fish, who didn't know where to find a fish, who didn't know this beautiful territory that used to give our people everything in the world to be well and to, to not know it. So he would bring me in our territory, and he didn't say, this is, what I need to this is what you need to know as an Indian man. He just said, this is what you need to know. And we would be on the land, 
And uh, sometimes we would have uh, like the school people come and see us and they'd say, uh, your son is supposed to be in school. By law, your son is supposed to be in school Monday to Friday. And my dad would, my dad had very colorful language. And he would say, don't tell me how to raise my children. I know how to raise my children. My grandmother taught me. So uh, he would keep me out of school. He resisted. And resistance is a part of strength and wellness. And believe me, uh, you students, you will need to resist sometimes. In our uh, medical school program, I was uh, temporary while, while uh, one of our physicians was off. We had 32 medical students. 31 of them reported racism uh, within the university system bad enough that it made them pause. 31 out of 32 indigenous students in, in medicine I would say that a racist incident against you is inevitable. And so I would say, you must be ready for it. You must be strong. You must not let someone's lousy words stop you. Come and talk to us. That's why we, that's why we have faculty. We didn't have faculty when we were training who were indigenous, but we can stick up for you. We can go over to that teacher and say, what happened? We won't be mean. I've tried that what the hell happened? And they don't talk to you. <laughs> but you can go over and say, hmm, so what happened with my student? I'd really like to know. So uh, my father uh, put us on the land, and he said, um, this is what you need to know. And I'm, I'm trying to get somewhere. I, I am. When I was in Hawaii, I went on sabbatical last year, and I went to the University of Hawaii, uh, to the School of Medicine there. One of the things that I heard, because uh, uh, the, the Hawaiian medical students would take a break from their medical studies and go paddling um, out in the beautiful water, um, one of the kapuna, the elders, said, uh, they always have to swim. They have to jump out of the canoe in the water. Because uh, when you're paddling, if you think you're going to stay in the canoe all the time, you're crazy. And I thought, ah, oh, that makes so much sense. That's so much of what my father would say uh, to me. If you think you're always going to be safe and in the canoe, you're crazy. And so he would make me jump in the water. And I, I, thought, he was, I thought he was the meanest dad ever. I didn't see other dads throwing their kids in the cold water. <laughs> but he said, you need to know what it's like in the water. And sometimes in our studies, we're not in the boat, we're in the water. And that's OK, because we're, we're going to make sure that you know how to swim. So I was, uh, I was a student uh, at McGill University. I was just in second year biochemistry. A woman came up to me on the street. She said, are you an actor? And I, I just lied. I don't know why I, I lied to her. I don't usually lie to people. I said, uh, yes. And she said, can you come and audition for me tomorrow? I said, OK. And I skipped biochemistry class. It was a boring fruit fly class anyway. <laughs> and uh, she cast me second lead in a movie. I was making, uh, this is 1982, 84. I was making $5,000 a week. And my job was to say things like, Toby, we're going to get in trouble. Collect $5,000. <laughs> it was way easier than biochemistry. And I had this thing that I call a Great Red Hope Syndrome, where any Indian student with a bit of promise, is told, you have to go to school and help the people, save the people, work for the people. And when I was young, it sounded really like a burden. And so being, becoming an actor, and I got my big break without even trying, and I got lots of parts after that first movie. This is called Toby McTeague, by the way. I'm sorry you can't see it. The light's right on it. But um, it was really fun. And then my job became, and I went to theater school after that, because I realized when I was making the movie, I kept kind of bumping into things. They would say, OK, Evan, in this shot, walk backwards from the camera uh, uh, and just pass by the camera. Like, let's say, this is the camera. I'm just going to walk like this. Cut, collect $5,000. Except I would bump into the camera. And they would say, what's wrong with you? Cameras are expensive. Uh, and then I realized I needed some training, some skill. So I went to theater school, and my job became uh, filling this space, just telling stories. Stand up, tell a story. Cool. I love that. Uh, and I stayed with it for 12 years. I quit biochemistry. 
I made this movie called Smoke Signals. I made about 50 movies, all in Canada. Uh, I loved doing this movie. I knew exactly how to play Thomas. I was the third Thomas. There actually the two Thomases before me, they got fired. So they were kind of desperate. I said, I'll do anything to play Thomas. And they said, oh, you can have it. Like, <laughs> just anybody, just somebody come and play Thomas. Uh, and uh, in my mind, I was playing uh, an old woman, the most beautiful old woman, a, an old elder, like your, your oldest family member who loves you so much that they would die for you. That's who I was playing, because I knew those elders. I was so rich when I was growing up. I knew those kinds of elders. And, uh, and I committed after, I thought, I'm going to make this movie, but I'm, it's time for me to go back to school. It's time for me to grow up. I've avoided being a doctor for a long time. I better go and do it. Except now I had to apply. And luckily I had a friend who believed in me. She said, you can be a doctor. Of course you can. I said, I'm a bimbo actor. I can't be a doctor. And she said, yeah, you, you can do it. It's easy. <laughs> it wasn't easy, but I believed her. <laughs> I applied. I remember, um, you know, we have to learn how to do physical exams. You can't quite, can you see what that is? Kind of, yeah. I kind of, I know that some of you are like under 21, so I wasn't sure if I should put this picture up. We're given these models to examine. I was playing with mine. I gave it a little voice. I was trying to make people laugh. And my instructor came in and she said, yeah, yeah, laugh all you want, but if you miss a lump and your patient dies from cancer, you have to be able to sleep at night. And I thought, how did an idiot like me become in charge of cancer? I have to look after that. And uh, it was shocking. It's still shocking to me. And, and so for those of you who got a bit freaked out with the immensity of what you were doing or how big it was that this summer, we all feel that way. We do. And I found out in medicine that th there was this phenomenal inequity. I thought I was going to be looking after people only to discover that there was this phenomenal inequity between us and them, and that part of our work as doctors was to raise the issue of equity and say, this is not fair. Race-based outcomes are immoral. We must make a change. And so uh, eventually I became a doctor. Was, I, uh, went to, I went to uh, this very large inner city hospital, 500 doctors on staff. It was called St. Paul's. I, I got into the doctor's lounge, they gave me my little electronic key. I looked exactly like this. White coat, collared shirt, tie, stethoscope, white jacket, a ponytail. I was there like less than five minutes. The security guard uh, came up to me and he said, I'm so sorry, sir, but one of the doctors has complained that there's an Indian in the doctor's lounge. And I, and I just laughed. I, I had faced a lot of baloney like that. I didn't feel bad. I just laughed. And I, what I wanted to say was, yeah, there's an Indian in the doctor's lounge. You better get used to it. In Canada, we have a very liberal government and we have something called reconciliation. Canada is trying to make peace with its indigenous roots. Canada has admitted that six generations of colonization has hurt our people. It has literally changed their bodies, changed their spirits, changed how they think and feel, and it was wrong. And uh, every um, institution in the country has been asked to look at reconciliation, uh, and we've recorded testimonials like my parents' stories of going to residential school for posterity so that Canada can remember at one time they did these inhumane things to indigenous peoples. So the Canadian Space Agency came to me and said, do you want to join us on the expert group on the potential health care and biomedical roles for deep space human space flight? We think it would be amazing if our next astronaut was an indigenous physician. And I said, of course I'll sit with you. That sounds amazing. My dad caught wind of it. He said, you're not going to Mars, are you? I said, how would you feel if I went to Mars? He said, you can't go to Mars. There's no nature there. And besides, if you go to Mars, then your sister Grace will want to go to Mars, and what will we do then? 
Canada talks about Indians in space. I wish that for you. And if, and if your current administration can't think of that, you can think that. So where are you going? Who are you becoming? My father used to say to me, and I, I don't mean any offense by this, he said, I didn't raise you to be a foot soldier in the white man's army. I raised you to help the people. I learned at the Canadian Space Agency while looking at astronauts' health, and astronauts are like elite athletes. They actually have extraordinarily good health. And uh, as a good public health doctor, I said, well, we shouldn't be trying to invent, and we really were talking about robotic surgical suites. I said, well, why don't you ask the astronauts what they want? I learned that from being around Indians. We can give the Indians an extraordinary healthcare system, but why don't we ask them what kind of healthcare system they want? <laughs> and uh, the astronauts said, actually, you know, the main issues for us, uh, we get bored when we're not at work. Because uh, imagine, they're living their life inside a tin can. Uh, we, um, we get bored and we miss our loved ones. I had never heard that our work was to help others do good things and to feel connected. But it made so much sense to me that we, just, we don't just look after people's bodies, but their minds and their spirits. So, so what is that? And, and it's clear to me that we, and I mean you as healthcare workers, need to be connected. And if you're not connected, you have to work on that. Don't worry about the other stuff. There'll be lots of us running through your paces. Hundreds of teachers in medicine, for instance, um, who teach you their things. But you need to be connected. Let us help you be connected. And that's part of what tonight is. And I remember going to an Indian health, or sorry, a, an Indian college, uh, and uh, they asked me to speak. And their elder uh, came and they said, who are you? And I said, I, I'm an actor doctor. I was in spoke signals. He went, oh. And then he watched me. And I, I just smiled. It's OK, because at home, the elders watch us too. Uh, I don't know if they do that here. They're looking at you. They're checking you out, going, hmm, have you been good? And they even say things like, Evan, you're getting a little fat. But, but this elder was looking at me, and I was OK. And he said, I'm looking at you to see if you're good in our way. Not good as in a good speaker, but good in our way. I'm looking to see if you're strong. He didn't say smart. He said, I'm looking to see if you're strong. I won't try and elder explain that. It's important to be strong. And it's important to remember that you need to bring way more than your Western training to the people. In fact, you need to be an extraordinary human being. And I always remember one of my elders, I was telling her about being in Emerge. I said, I was in Emerge today. Can you imagine? I was so busy. We had like two chest pains. Someone was having a stroke. There was a motor vehicle accident. Three people came in. I needed to see them. And the little old lady with diarrhea asked me to go and get her a glass of water. Can you imagine? And my elder said, oh, maybe she thought you were there to help. She really put me in my place. I was trying to raise myself up. And she said, remember, you're supposed to be helping. And, and I, I really want us to remember that at its heart, looking after others is not about smart. It's not about grades. It's not about school. It's not about letters after your name. It's about kindness. And I hope that you can see yourself on this beautiful road heading towards doing good things, being connected, helping the people, and making us all, including your own family and ancestors, very proud. And who knows where you'll go. Thank you very much.